this particular overhead is up before you this morning is that this has not happened here, but inevitably, um, I quote a lot of Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts and the pioneers. Inevitably, and again, this is not as if anyone has said this here, they have not, but someone will say, well, you know, you're a worshiper of John Thomas. And you, look, I believe very strongly in eldership. And I would not know the truth uh, today as I know it, to whatever degree that is, if it were not for Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, Brother Mansfield and the likes, uh, and those that uh, have also given exposition in the like spirit of those brethren, which I greatly appreciate. And Brother Roberts took that up, and he talks about, but I, I think reaching how you reach the conclusion is as important to the con as the conclusion itself, showing the process, which is one of the reasons I like Eureka. I use it as a en encyclopedia. I got five volumes, and I use the fifth that's got a, you know, like a Whatever, dictionary, I can't even find the word right now. Uh, I'm sorry? Index. That was a tough word, wasn't it? Index? <laughs> that's a, that's, a, that's going to tell you how the class is going to go right now, isn't it? <laughs> I'm from Texas. Dr. Thomas not only gives you his conclusions, but the reasons that led to those conclusions, and by that we're able to make his conclusions our own by a process that makes us independent of all men as to the ground which we hold them, the best proof of the soundness of the views advanced by Dr. Thomas lie in this, that once a reader is directed by him to the Bible and becomes a Bible student, that's all we're ever trying to create in the truth, he can dispense with Brother Thomas' books altogether so far as steadfastness of conviction is concerned. The Bible nourishes that conviction from day to day but don't try and steal my books from Brother Thomas. Remember, I'm from Texas. We're all armed and dangerous. <laughs> and then Brother Mansfield says this, and this is a quote that I wanted to put in as well. I've been accused at straining of types, and he's talking about Lee and Rachel here, um, 1962. But apart from such an enigmatical, somebody help me with that word, significance, why should such chapters find a place in the divine revelation? Paul in Galatians 4 shows that the similar circumstance between Sarah and Hagar are recorded because they were allegorical. Why not the jealousy and rivalry of Leah and Rachel also? And so it always struck me, and the notes on the bottom of the page are mine, that and I do this myself, if you were to look at my Bible. We rightly stranded every word in our prophetic studies of Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation, so on and so forth, the law, we make sure every word, even if it's it or his, it at or door, we take every word and we break it down prophetically. Why not equally the prophetic parable? Why not line upon line, precept upon precept, as it were, when you go through the life of Esther, developing it likewise as a prophecy? We know it's not just recorded history and facts but its principles associated with those facts and its allegory at the same time, which, of course, a lot of brethren write. So all these stories concerning the Jews and Israel in the Bible, I personally believe, are divinely recorded in the Scriptures of Truth for that reason. Study them to with the same degree that you're studying prophecy, and you will find prophetic things therein. So we left off yesterday at this point that Esther bade return Mordecai the answer. Remember, he was covered in sackcloth. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. We clearly see the connection there. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and then I will go into the king, which he told her to do, which is not according to the law. And she said, uh, if it may be that I find grace and favor in his sight. So we know what fast represents in the Bible very simply. It goes all the way back to the garden. It is refraining from the indulgence of the flesh, and you'll find that throughout the scriptures. I think we all know that. The three days, three nights, pretty fundamental in the prophetic parable, which is dealing with Esther at this stage. And remember, as we said before, we were talking about this this morning, Brother Jonathan Bowen and myself, Vashti was put away representing Israel under that feast that she wanted to have, just the law, not the Christ feast, that does not mean Israel is forever put, put away. When we see the Jews in the latter uh, uh, part of Esther, 
which God willing we'll get to tomorrow and Saturday, it's Jews not forever put away, but restored under Mordecai, the Redeemer. So we have a perfect thread of what we believe is the gospel. And likewise, Haman, he's a representative of, of course, Diabolos, the flesh. And then he is also a representative of the devil or politically manifested in Gog, which we'll look at a little bit, I think, God willing, today. These events that transpire when they're written, take place on the 13th day of the first month. And as everyone just about answered in unison yesterday, well, what happens on the next three days and three nights here? Well, it's the 14th day of the first month is when the Passover is celebrated. So this puts this context now right in this period of Passover. And she said, I will go in according to law. If I perish, I perish. She's not presumptuous, but she's doing it based on the command of Mordecai. So she makes herself ready for that particular event that we'll uh, deal with, and she does it on the principle of grace. Now, it came to pass on the third day. Notice, there's almost a silence in the record of two days. Almost a silence. You have that, by the way, in the Genesis 22 parable of Abraham offering up Isaac. It says, you know, went three days' journey, then on the third day, and there's like nothing in between the verses. He's good as dead for three days. It came to pass on the third day that Esther, this is how she's going to approach the king, on this principle of grace outside the law. She puts on the royal apparel, the clothing of Christ, and she's going to stand in the inner court in the king's house. Over against the king's house, the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance. So she's on the inner court, and we know what that represents when we get into things like the temple and the tabernacle. It's the area of fellowship. And on the third day, of course, is the time where the, the Lord was resurrected. She's put on Christ. That phrase is also used, as I mentioned here, um, Abraham the father offers his son Isaac. It's used when David received the crown at the hand of the Amalekites. After three days, he came forth from the dead and gave the crown, um, when Hezekiah recovered from his sickness, Brother Jason, and when Jesus was raised from the grave to become the mediator. So that's what you get on that phrase in the third day, on the third day. Obviously, I think that's something we're all pretty familiar with. It's just building the parable. But he's told to go in, and he's raised on the third day, and he's a mediator now, this bride, and he tells the bride what to do. Go and appeal to the king for the salvation of the Jews. And he says, think not that you'll escape. And our class yesterday ended with salvation is of the Jews on the principle of our redemption is based on the redemption of those people. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And he goes on to say, let us come confidently before that throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. It has to be done outside law based on the principle of mercy. And Hebrews 10 adds this, speaking of Christ, we're consecrated by his blood. She identifies with him in the three days, no eating and drinking. She puts on the royal peril. And then it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance. Look what the phrase says in Esther. And Esther drew near. She has the royal apparel on her now. She's identified with the death and resurrection of Christ as the new man. And she stands in the inner court of fellowship and she obtains favor in his sight. And he holds out the scepter representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we have at least three references that say that which is a scepter that also represents the kingdom. That's very important. Unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom because it's a kingdom that belongs to the deity himself, but one extended from his hand that he's given to the power of a certain one. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, soon to be, we will see, figurative, typical, typified. That's the word I was looking for. I knew when I couldn't find index, I was gone. 
in Mordecai. So she obtains favor. And she does it outside the law. There's no hesitation because she's been commanded by this man and she's following the order of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't say this presumptuously. I'm just saying as a matter of doctrine, brethren. If we do the commandments of Christ, which has to do with our clothing and identifying with his death and resurrection, that's not just talk or just a doctrine. We actually have to live it. We will obtain favor of Yahweh in that day. We will. It's not like a mocking question. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And I, I'm with you. I, none of us say that presumptuously. And she's not presumptuous here. She's very fearful. She's very coherent to pro prepare herself accordingly. Then the king said unto her, and here it is. It's the scepter held out. And I know that it's a figure of speech. But he says, what will thou, Esther? It will be given unto thee unto the half of the kingdom. And again, I understand it's a figure of speech. But it also represents something to you and I. Because it is the reward of the saints. And it is his delight to give us that kingdom. And Esther says, as we make all petitions and prayer according to the will of the heavenly Father, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day to a banquet that I have prepared. And the king said, cause Haman to make haste. You run with speed and you bring him now that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther, at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? It will be granted. What is thy request? Even unto the half of the kingdom. The banquet of wine, of course, is a symbol for the covering of sin. And there are two people here. There is the king. She has invited them. It's Yahweh and sin. That's who she has invited to the banquet of wine. The supreme righteous one and the supreme evil one. Those are the two principles the ecclesia must address. Not just the kingdom. If the Ecclesia, your Ecclesia, my Ecclesia, never wants to deal with sin, never wants to bring it out and deal with it, which was the whole purpose of the law, so that you even know you need a Redeemer to begin with, you have left one of the parties out. Do not be afraid to address sin. And one of the difficulties in addressing sin, brothers and sisters, is just like what I had to do the other evening to stand up and say, oh, Brother Garth, give a talk on the family, the strength of the ecclesia. You know, if you knew my family, you'd say, well, who is he? It's very hard to do. Very hard to do. Because unless my two daughters are in perfect order and my wife and myself, it's very hard to give that talk. But we have to deal with it, brethren, whether it pierces us or not. And by the way, this word banquet is the same word feast that Vashti refused. It's the Christ feast. So there are two banquets of wine, a first one, then a second one. And at the first one, Esther, the ecclesia, brings the king and Haman to be present with the bride. Between these two, and we'll see this in a moment, Mordecai is exalted. Mordecai is exalted. And at the second one, Haman is exposed and he is brought down. What do we remember? What is the issue of the banquet of wine that we remember? Matthew 26. It is not just the principle of the remission of sin. Christ says, do this in remembrance of me until, I'm shortening it, the kingdom. When I drink it new with you in the kingdom, there are two aspects 
which is why there are two banquets of wine. She deals with Haman in the first, and between the two is the exaltation of this man. Sin and the kingdom, those aspects are roundly in, in, in balance addressed by the ecclesia. We talk about what we need to do to become better, and we talk about the future glory of the kingdom that stands before us. And we try to put that the best of our ability in, in a uh, very balanced way. So why does the destruction of Haman represent two things? I think I have to answer this if I'm an honest student of the scriptures. Why does the st- destruction of Haman represent two things? It represents the sacrifice of Christ, which I don't dispute, and the destruction of Gog. He's Haman the Agagite. Septuagint has Gog in Numbers 24. Political. Why are these two represented in this one case? Because the two actions are simultaneous. The Jews did not understand the Messiah at his first advent. They will not understand the Messiah until his first advent, until he comes at his second. And in fact, they shall look on him whom they pierce, we often forget, is actually quoted at his first advent in John. You're not buying that? Okay, here's a little H.P. Mansfield for you. That ought to put you in your place. Salvation will not only be from the overwhelming power of Gog, but also from Israel's past transgression and rebellion. Two things. Against their king, which separated them in times past, a period of 2,000 years, then the promises to the fathers of Israel will be achieved. The word save is from that word yasha, the root form of Yahshua. This salvation will require the Jews acknowledge and acclaim the Lord as their Messiah. He goes on to say, as the Jews experience the divine goodness and come to recognize their past blindness and folly, they are completely humbled. The revelation granted them will call for a national day of humiliation by which they recognize their guilt and that the land has been defiled by blood. And Haman, remember, took the cup and sat down. Let his blood be upon us. And that it was at the hand of Haman for all this time. They will make a connection between the enemy and Gog and missing the Messiah at his first advent. And they will look on him whom they've pierced. Is everybody okay with that so far? You're smarter than Texans. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful with a glad heart. He's in the highest position, next unto the king. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved, he was filled with indignation. And that phrase means he trembled not, like the NIV RSV has, any other translation, and it means this. He had absolutely no fear. No fear. And this man has issued an edict that's going to slaughter all the Jews. And he had no fear of him. And remember what I've suggested, that the two men at the end of chapter 2 that kept the door that were hanged, representing political, religious, Jew and Gentile, both putting Christ to death, and also the redemption of both Jew and Gentile, Christ at his first advent. Because this is what it says in Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Again, we are trying to work honestly through the scriptures chronologically, and I believe all All prophetic parables are in perfect chronological order as they're laid out accurately in your Bible. I do not believe we have to jump around from chapter to chapter. I've never seen that pattern before, and it's, I've never had to do that. Christ in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, to him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard in that he feared. And it's applied again for us that he's delivered us, all of us, who through fear of death were subject to bondage. 
This man has no fear because he is no longer under the dominion of sin and death. He's in a different constitution of things. Watch what happens. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. It's the developing principle of Haman. Haman go. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends. There's a company now of Ag Agag and Zeresh, his wife. There is now entered in another feminine counterpart to Esther. Haman the Agagite has a feminine counterpart too. I think this is tremendous. So Haman tells of all the glorious riches and the multitude of his children. We'll find out what happens to them later. And how Yahweh has promoted him, the king. And Haman said, moreover, yet Esther, the queen, did invite no man to the banquet that she has prepared only myself and the king. And by the way, that word multitude, speaking of the multitude of his children, exactly the same word that you find in Ezekiel and Joel. The multitude and multitude that come down upon Israel. So let's advance this. Yet all of this availeth me nothing as long as I see Mordecai in a somewhat exalted position before the king. He's in the king's gate. And who moves him to destroy Mordecai? Zeresh, his wife, said, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits. And that number has got to mean something. I just can't get my head around it. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. And you know, your margin says that the gallows were prepared and the word means tree. But he's already been crucified, figuratively, back at the end of Esther chapter 2. He will appear the second time without sin. He will never suffer that again. And watch what goes forth here. Zeresh is the feminine counterpart that moves Agag against Mordecai and the Jews. And this happened just last month. There is a marrying now that is going on between the brass and the iron. The Edom principle is coming together incredibly fast before our eyes, namely by this man. He is considered by experts as not only perhaps one of the single most powerful men ever to rise in Europe, He's more powerful than the Russian mafia now. And here's the scary thing, if you're someone in the world. Just like Hitler, he is enormously popular. There hasn't been a U.S. president that is anywhere on the field of how popular this man is. And you see him moving his people on religious moral ground. He claims to be Christian all the time against the West. He said the moral standard of the world is Russia. Look at the West. And one of the things he's used as a symbol is just what our Supreme Court in this country passed. And he said, they claim to be Christian? I don't think so. You watch the movements of this man as they go forward. And there's a marrying of this feminine counterpart. And historians, experts, the same guys with the tape on the middle of their glasses, they say that Zeresh means the golden one. And if you look at other, some other experts, they say her name means the goddess, which takes you back to the Babylonian system of gold, the system of worship. And that's, of course, what Nebuchadnezzar did. He built that whole image of gold. And that's what that system is known. You've got Esther in the silver empire and Mordecai in redemption of the Jews. 
And you've got Haman the Agagite now with Zeresh in the system of gold moving him to do it. The goddess of worship and the system of gold. I mean, I won't even comment. So on that night, the king could not sleep. So he calls and commands his servants who've recorded this to retrieve the chronicles of the king. And it is found written in what happened when Christ hung on the tree. And the question arises, has he ever openly been rewarded for what he did? It said, King of the Jews, it said it, has he ever been rewarded for that? And you know what the book of records is. The apocalypse tells us. There's a book of daily works and there's a book of life. And it's very appropriate that one man's name was called first from that book. And that, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ. The first fruits from among the dead, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. And he could not sleep, just like Nebuchadnezzar. And it's symbolic of an unsettled state of the kingdom. Something regarding the kingdom is unsettled, which is why Nebuchadnezzar could not sleep. And his sleep went from him. And the same thing when what happens? Daniel goes into the den of the lions, save me from the lion's mouth, Psalm 22. And the stone is rolled upon it, just like Christ. And he's resurrected out of that, and the king comes early in the morning, and he cries, oh, Daniel is thy God whom I serve, able to save thee in the silver kingdom. And he's raised up out of the grave. Some issue of the kingdom has not been settled. And this happens on that night and the third day. Do I need to quote Hosea 6? Let's turn to Hosea 6. Daniel Hosea. It is also the third day that Israel will be resurrected. Come, let us return unto Yahweh. I'm a Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. For he hath torn, he put us in the hand of Haman. He hath smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight. And you can go down reading through verse 3. It's also the resurrection of the nation of Israel. And the book of Chronicles, very significantly, and we know this from our individual studies, I notice Brother Jason is quoting a lot of Chronicles regarding to Hezekiah. While Kings was really dealing with the secular affairs, Chronicles that doesn't really record some of the bad things that happen is the religious affairs. And it was extracted from the words of the prophets. That's, where, that's how we came with the book of Chronicles. It records the affairs of the kingdom in a religious realm as it was drafted by the prophets. So it's a religious book. So we're not just looking at a political thing here when the book of Chronicles is brought before the king to reward and award this man. And the king says, what honor and dignity hath been done unto this man? And Christadelphians that serve him say nothing yet. And the king said, and you notice he's always asking questions to his servants. What does the law say regarding Vashti? What should be done? Let another law be written. What does the law say about this? It is important what we do and what we do not know about the truth really what we do know about the truth. And where was Esther? She was at the inner court touching the sepulcher. That's the wrong word. Scepter. That's definitely the wrong word. This is not a good word day. 
and she obtained favor. Here's Haman in the outward court. And what does the apocalypse call that? It's the court without of the Gentiles. He's on the outer court and in the temple and tabernacle, it's where the altar was where flesh is put to death. And that's where he is. And they say, who's there? Haman was come to the outward court to put to death the same man that they just said has not yet received his reward. And the king's servant said, Behold, it's Haman, Haman that standeth in the outer court. They know all about the advancement of the powers against the Jew. And they know that time is coming to an end. So Haman comes in and the king says, What shall be done unto man, the man in whom the king delighteth? Now, Haman, being very humble that he is, says, well, that's got to be me. He's moved by Zeresh, his wife, and it says he thought in his heart. He thought in his heart. Who else does he desire more than me? That is the motive in the phrase that's used in Ezekiel 38. Gog shall think an evil thought in his mind that will bring him upon the Jews in the land of Israel. He's pretty confident now that he has the endorsement of the king. So you have a political religious alliance on two different sides. You've got the king and Esther who are looking for the salvation of the Jews and exaltation of Mordecai, and you've got Haman and Zeresh for the de death of the Jews and the destruction of Mordecai. And by the way, this is a little thing that I got from the um, uh, uh, Middle Eastern magazine online that I wasn't aware of. If anybody knows this more than I do, please raise their hand. Because another one said that actually the Russian Greek church not only owns the most Christian property in Israel, but actually the most property in Israel. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, if anybody wants to expand that a little bit further later, the big, big, so they have an interest. Um, so you're seeing this alliance come uh, nonetheless. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen this chart before? Israel's brought back from the sword. I will call for the sword against Go. Israel is brought out of the valley full of bones. Gog and his multitude will be buried in the valley of Haman Gog. I am Yahweh, I have opened the graves, and I will give Gog a place for the graves. All the things that this man desire are going to be re reversed on him. Behold, the shaking of bones will come together. Behold, there will be a great shaking in the land. Have you ever seen this chart? I'm glad you have it, because I actually stole it from Jim Cowie. So now that when he uses it, you'll think he stole it from me. He did. He, I guess where I got this. Israel, thy carcass shall be meat for the fowls of the air. What of Gog? Thy carcass and the ravenous birds will pluck it. So all the things that this man desires are going to be reversed upon him. Completely reversed upon him. As he's going to resurrect one, he's going to put the other in the grave. Remember where you saw this chart first. It was good, so I stole it. At least I'm an honest thief, and I tell you where I get it. Haman answered the king, says, For the man in whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king weareth. The horse that the king rides on and the crown royal that is set on the head of the king and bring him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaim before him. He's clothed with the nature of the deity himself. He's got the military power of the deity himself. And he's got the authority and the ruling power with the crown of the deity himself. That's what Haman's desire is. And so the king says, as thou hast said. And everything that you just said, go do unto Mordecai the Jew that man that you disdain. So they take him through the street and they proclaim loud before him. 
and the seventh angel sounded, the kingdoms of this world are to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And now we're going to see the fall of Gog at the manifestation of the Son of God when he is lifted up and exalted. Mordecai exalted and Haman abased. Simultaneous events in their development. And the next few chapters are going to go into this. When the Lord is rewarded and openly manifested for his loyalty to the kingdom and self-sacrifice, that's going to be on the very eve of the fall of the Gogian host, ripe for destruction, which we're just about to see. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, and Haman went mourning, having his rosh covered. Isn't that significant about Mordecai? He's just had all the king's honor placed upon him, and he goes to resume the position of a servant that he had before. He is still a servant of Yahweh, absolute and foremost which is why he was exalted, which is why he put the two men to death that conspired against the king that were keepers of the door, because his love and his honor is servitude for the king and the kingdom. And what happens at the end of the thousand years? The kingdom is turned back over to Yahweh himself, and the son is subject unto God. He is looking for no desire of himself, the words that he spake, the works that he did, he constantly gave all credit to Yahweh himself. Very, very humble man we see here. And Haman told Zeresh, I think we, we may have to wrap up with this section. Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends the things that had befallen him. And the wise men in Zeresh, his wife, said, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews be whom, before whom thou hast begun to fall, you're sunk. And she promoted and provoked him to take action against him. As long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the gate of the king, I, all of this avails me nothing. Destroy him. Now those for words of consolation from your wife. Oh, it didn't work? Oh, you're sunk. That is a willing knowledge, brothers and sisters, of this feminine gold goddess. Like Balaam, he will curse the Jews knowing that the prophecies of God demand their blessing. We don't just fault Christendom for being astray. We deliberately and distinctly look at the Roman Catholic system who turned the truth of God into a lie with deceivable, deceivableness, one of those words, and all unrighteousness because they received not the love of the truth. They admit, I don't know if you know this, brothers and sisters, the Catholics admit a lot of Christadelphian doctrine. They admit the Jews once represented the kingdom of God. Search it on your own. They absolutely will tell you the Jews were the kingdom, but we are now. They will tell you the Bible does not speak of the immortality of the soul. It's not in there. Infant baptism, search in vain all day long. Ain't there. But there are certain truths which Christ and the apostles taught, which are not recorded in the scriptures, but are embodied in the life, practice, and ministry of the church in her written and unwritten traditions, which supplement the biblical record. That is a willing turning of the truth of God into a lie. That is exactly what Balaam did. They will take wages to corrupt truth into a lie, and that's a system that is corrupt and perverse beyond our comprehension. Oh, 
Yeah, your son came in. What miserable comforting. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's chamberlains hasted to bring Haman to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Who were the king's chamberlains by type? They're servants. They're who? Christadelphians can't wait to see this happen. Yeah, we can't wait to see Haman hasted to this destruction. We hope it's this afternoon, mostly so I get out of class tonight. <laughs> the saints of the Most High will take that kingdom, and they can't wait to bring Gog down. Brothers and sisters, how does Esther prepare the banquet for Haman's fall? You know what happens oftentimes? Brother Reuben, back that up a couple minutes, that clock over there on the wall. You know what happens oftentimes? We see the prophetic parables as they develop, brothers and sisters, and we get stuck. We get down a road and we go, I don't know. And you take a step back and you move back into just a character study. Not that there's anything wrong with a character study. Keep fighting, keep praying, keep fasting, keep pounding away. And it just so happened while I was studying this, I was studying Uncle Jim's, Cowie's, notes, brief notes on the apocalypse. How does the ecclesia arrange for Haman's fall? And actually, Brother Steve may address this. I don't know. I've been in the classes. That's the cry that's forever gone up. How long? Those who's, who are under the altar. Believers in every age have echoed that appeal, how long? And this is what I found. Apocalypse 8, verses 1 through 7. And another angel came and stood at the altar. And you should read what Brother Thomas and H.P. Mansfield have to say about this, if you don't believe me. And he came and he stood at the altar having golden censer. And we know what that is. We're told it was the prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense came with the prayers of the saints and ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And he takes the prayers of the saints filled with fire from off the altar and he cast it down to the earth. And the judgments go forth. He is listening to our prayers, brothers and sisters. And it happens again in the Apocalypse chapter 9. The sixth angel sounds, and he hears the voice from the four horns of the golden altar. That's the altar of prayer. Saying to the sixth angel that had the trumpet, loose the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the judgments go forth. The effect of Esther is tremendous on the fall of Haman. It's very, very significant that in the apocalypse, when those judgments go forth, they're taken from the prayers of the saints so that we have a hand in their fall. Again, I refer to the exhortation. We're not just standing flat-footed, picking up the issues that go forth in that seventh epoch of time. We're taken, Hebrews 2, of what the angels have arranged right now, and we become angels in the age to come managing the affairs. We're nurturing them along. Isn't that splendid, brothers and sisters? If I explained it well. And so the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had, and the king said again unto Esther the second day of the banquet, what is thy petition? This is the second banquet. The second banquet. Look what Isaiah says. Hear now this, thou afflicted, and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, the ruler, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling that Haman had and sat down. Even the dregs of the cup of my fury and thou shalt no more drink of it again, and I will put it in the hand of those that afflict thee. 
the Jews were under affliction and drinking of that cup of fury. And soon Gog and all his multitudes are going to be drinking of it. He's going to remove hands. And his fury is going to be poured out on them. We'll conclude with this. My apologies. One minute. At the first banquet, the bride communes with both the king and Haman, understanding the judgment of wine upon Israel. At the second, Haman's intent to completely destroy the Jews is met with judgment upon himself. I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all that are round about, and they that burden themselves with it, this cup of trembling, will be shattered in pieces that come against it. I think I have a final quote. He that scattered Israel certainly will gather them, and he will ransom them from the hand of him that was stronger than he. I think we have to lead off there. We've already cheated a minute. Thank you, brethren.